Guys, I just realized um, I had stopped. I, sorry to interrupt. I realized that I hadn't been recording the meeting as we typically do, so I apologize that you just got that oh, notification. We're meeting in secret. We are. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's all it's all good. I mean, they're going to miss all my great intro now, but that's okay. really all right. I apologize for that. <laughs> so at a high level, this is how the fuel cell works. You know, uh, for those of you who really like to put on their uh, their chemistry uh, textbooks and their their evening um, hangout sessions, uh, this is going to look very similar to a battery, right? You've got an anode and cathode in the system. It's just that our anode and cathode actually are reacting with um, gases instead of either solid state systems or liquid systems. I've worked on flow batteries in the past, which are liquid based. I've worked on lithium ion, which is more of a solid state system. Those fuel cells get kind of put together in stacks. Those are the things that are manufactured in San Jose. Those get installed in modules. And that is actually a really important thing to think about with our, our, our technology is that, you know, there's a ton of redundancy in the technology itself, right? So as you build them up into these energy servers, you have, you know, the ability to have as many failures as that, that could occur in normal manufacturing, you know, operations, but the system still stays on. And that's really important when you think about what the grid is going to need in the long run. And um, especially when you're trying to think about preventing, you know, power outages, especially when you have certain weather events, like these systems handle everything. They've been tested through hurricanes. You know, when Hurricane Sandy ran through uh, New York and New Jersey, I actually was down there at the time. Um, our system stayed on and where we had our sites where we had designed intentional microgrids, those systems stayed on and it's because of this building block technology. Um, so four key features that we really try to like, you know, point to uh, with our, our system. Um, the biggest one in my view is the no combustion category, right? So, you know, unlike uh, standard natural gas or diesel systems, there is no flame, there is no running engine like you would expect from the normal on-site systems that are about this this uh, size and footprint. It's just an electrochemical process, right? Um, it is fuel flexible. As I mentioned earlier, you know, we've run on hydrogen as our core uh, when we first made our designs. Um, today, these systems are being proposed to run off of natural gas, but they can easily switch over to biogas since it's basically the exact same chemistry. Um, Extremely efficient. When you look at our uh, operations and our and our use of natural gas and converting it into electricity, uh, there is no better product out there right now. Um, especially when you compare us to you know the the standard gas supply that is in our our grid today. Um, lastly, and this is not as important to Maine, although I do think Maine uh, as a state is generally holistic about its environmental impact, and so it probably will you know, want to think about water consumption here. This is particularly important in areas of California where a large set of our initial projects have been installed. Um, you know, we don't use any water during our operations and that's similar to wind and solar. Uh, but that's particularly important when you compare us to, again, the bulk of the energy system in New England right now, which is natural gas uh, combustion systems. Uh, so I'm going to try to jump through some of these real quickly um, just because uh, I know we're short on time. Uh, another layer that I think is actually unique to Bloom and somewhere where actually I started to become uh, sensitive to my career and my involvement in the uh, renewable energy uh, revolution um, is around product life management, right? Um, I'm sure everyone's seen headlines about, uh, you know, wind projects finally hitting their 20 year um, end of life uh, points. You probably hear lots of solar stuff eventually moving in that direction too. And especially in a lot of the town meetings that I've done in Massachusetts and other states, um, you know, when you're asking about decommissioning bonds and all those things with solar projects, you really want to think about like, how are they going to handle these products at the end of life? So Bloom actually uh, recycles 98% of its product by weight. Um, and we've been doing that over the last decade of operations. So our systems don't go all 20 years and then decommission suddenly. We actually replace parts along the way. Um, you know, it depends on what environment we're in, depending on how quickly we do it. You could think of it every five or six years, something like that. Um, but as we, you know, kind of take those systems back and install new systems, uh, which again, is a really quick plug and play thing. Um, it, we take all of those systems back, we break them down. In some cases, we just reuse the parts ourselves, maybe with some sandblasting. In other cases, we actually break down the parts, send them back to our initial vendors they use those raw materials again and then send them back to us as used parts or new parts. Um, and so this is actually a really important feature to me personally. Um, I think that this 
is important when you think about you know us using energy in the future. It's not just about the fuels, but it's also about um, the technology itself being recycled. So, you know, high level view on um, I think what is going to be one of the more important topics today, uh, which is kind of how how these projects have an impact on the grid, right? You know, solar wind they are extremely clean technologies. They're not creating emissions. They're not, um, you know, having any impact from a particulates perspective. They're not consuming water, right? These are all things that are unique to gas combined cycle systems, natural gas systems like ours, and the like. Um, diesel systems are going to be atrocious compared to some of these numbers, but you get the general thought, right? Um, there are projects that, you know, are important to the grid uh, that have some impact on the environment. So our system uses natural gas and it emits CO2. Now, um, you know, the way I kind of think about this is not just about uh, is it creating CO2 or not, but is it the most efficient use of that CO2 that's being created, right? Um, when you compare us again to uh, the other technologies that are currently being used in the ISO New England grid, we actually are reducing the marginal emissions by about 17%. That's equivalent to almost 65,000 gallons of gas consumed per year per project. Right. So this assumes one megawatt projects. So I know the, the number five came up earlier for an ordinance element, but this is, these are one megawatt projects, actually 975 kW. Um, and this is the potential uh, savings that you could see from the grid today. So essentially the thought process here is, you know, you're running combined cycle generators to power the grid. You're using solar, you're using wind. Um, and every time you use one of our systems, we're displacing one of those higher generating uh, systems, right? So every time we're on, it reduces the, the reliance on those dirtier technologies. And so that's kind of our, our uh, metrics on CO2. On particulates, this is actually another interesting one because we don't have a combustion engine. We don't release NOx and SOx. This is something that is a consequence of some of the impurities in our natural gas supply. And so that can actually result in the equivalent savings of about somewhere between fourteen dollars and $32,000 per year per project. Uh, the dollar amount isn't what I think matters to me here. It's more about the particulates, right? When you think about uh, grid reliability and resiliency over time, there's only a couple of ways to solve that. One is you run a whole bunch of transmission lines to these centralized power plants, and you can put those power plants far enough away from the population that those particulates aren't as big of an impact. Option two is you put diesel gensets or on-site generators of other forms and those will create particulates, right? And they will be in the areas where you really don't want people kind of inhaling this stuff. And so this is another big layer for, for us as well. And then I talked earlier about the, the water consumption as well. It's just kind of cool to see it uh, sized out in Olympic swimming pools. So this would be saving about 164 Olympic pools, uh, which is, a, in my opinion, a pretty big deal. So I know I've been talking a little bit about uh, the marginal emissions and the use of natural gas in the grid. Uh, so on the right hand side of the screen here, I've got uh, a graph or a pie chart that kind of talks about our current fuel mix, right? So we've got renewables, which are about 12% of our fuel mix, 7% uh, hydro, you know, 26% uh, nuclear. Um, you've got load reduction, oil, coal, natural gas. You'll see coal is actually down to like basically zero now, which is great. I'm really proud to be in a network that has kind of displaced that. Um, obviously that's a, a big particular generator, lots of CO2. So it's great that ISO New England has gotten there, but that's basically been displaced mostly by natural gas. So natural gas is a part of our system, whether we want it to be or not. Uh, and ISO New England is saying is going to continue to be a part of our system. And, and there's a, a, the main reason for that is that the growth of our load, our energy consumption is outpacing our ability to put renewables on the grid. And there's several reasons for those constraints. In some cases, it's because we don't have enough transmission infrastructure put in place. Uh, and in some cases, it's because, you know, we just don't have enough land, right? Solar and wind both use a lot of land. And unfortunately, that means there's only so many places that we can put these things. Um, and so natural gas is going to be a part of our system. And, and my, my argument here would be that, you know, why not use the most efficient system you can in those conditions to minimize the CO2 that you're putting out? right, to minimize the particulates, to minimize the water consumption. And that's where I think these projects actually do add a lot of value to the grid. But, you know, in the long run, you know, when you kind of look into the, you know, 20 year horizon of these projects, um, the grid could absolutely clean up, right? We could find lots of ways to start using offshore wind. We could start using more and more 
uh, wave energy, right? Uh, we could potentially put in more hydro. There's lots of ways to clean up the grid. And if we start moving in that direction, there's a couple of different ways we can start to glean, clean up our fuel source. Um, the first thing I kind of point to is the fact that these do qualify as class one recs. Uh, they are renewable energy resources under state law. Um, and so, you know, technically it's kind of already in that program and we can actually uh, offer those renewable energy credits to the power consumers to make sure everyone's kind of cleaning up and, and passing their ESG goals. Um, the second is we can continue to, uh, you know, support and facilitate biogas and uh, directed renewable fuels, right? So there are some projects in Maine where we're using biogas uh, and actually injecting that into the grid and we can use that as a directed fuel source to our products as well. Uh, again, especially when you look at our, our longer event horizon year. Uh, finally, as I mentioned earlier, you know, I think in the long run, uh, the grid will eventually evolve away from natural gas and start using other clean fuels. Hydrogen is one of them, right? Um, and hydrogen can be created from renewable energy resources like solar and wind and can actually tie into areas where we have a surplus of electricity and aren't necessarily able to consume it and can be kind of stored in this molecule form. And these projects are already future proof, right? They're ready to convert to those uh, uses as soon as the grid is ready to convert over there as well. And for what it's worth, Bloom does make an electrolyzer product, right? So we actually are already starting to work with uh, utilities in Maine and Massachusetts and other states uh, to potentially start cleaning up the grid and putting in more hydrogen uh, to help clean up uh, our natural gas supply as well. Um, so at a high level, I guess the last thing I kind of want to point out here is at the beginning of the discussion, we talked a little bit about the 200% export feature here. And uh, I really do like that high level idea of separating the concept of large scale power plants that are meant to ship power all over the state versus being used locally within the town, right? And these projects are inherently designed to be on the local distribution network. They are not designed to push power up into the substations and then up into the transmission system. And that's actually one of the biggest things that got me excited about Bloom uh, back in December and January was that, you know, I think we need to get away from this concept of these legacy large, you know, combined cycle turbines that sit in a certain location and then shoot transmission lines everywhere. We need to start siting generation where people demand it as well. This is very similar to rooftop solar, right? Um, you're trying to put the generation source where the load is. These projects are likely to put more power onto the grid than the what is going to be consumed on those particular properties, but they are unlikely to push it beyond the local network right there. In fact, that's something that Pete and I are trying to avoid because when you start pushing power up into the uh, transmission system, you are potentially subject to extra upgrades and extra costs on the project. And so, you know, we are incentivized to try to design the systems to offer power to the local uh, community, if that makes sense. And with that, I'll kind of uh, stop and open up to questions. Pete, if there's anything else you also wanted to add, I'm happy to, to turn it over to you. Yeah, I'll just, I'll echo your thoughts on, these are distributive generation projects. So the point of the exporting cap, uh, this, this power all, power works like water in a pipe. It's just path of least resistance. It's gonna go where it's needed. So by the nature of these being plugged into the distribution grid, we are connecting to the local the poles and wires that you see on the on the roadside service. The power will be consumed. Any any amount of exporting power will be consumed in that immediate area. You know, because it's as it's drawn, it's it's pulled off the grid and used. So the location I have is on Two Cummins Road. It's a hotel. It's a hotel group I work with. Power will be consumed at that facility up that up Cummins Street, down Cummins Street, and out by the main mall. Um, you know, each of these projects at one megawatt or 975 kW will produce around 8 million kilowatt hours a year. Um, and so if you think of that general area of the main mall area, you could really use three or four of these in that area and it would still, you're not really exporting it anywhere beyond that immediate area, you know, because of the consumption of everything in that area, homes, businesses, they're all fed from that immediate roadside service. Uh, we have a, a question in the room. So yep. Tim, if you want to go ahead. Um, I'm just wondering about a sense of the ratio of the actual customer and their own electricity use rather than the neighborhood at this point. So is our rule getting in the way of these projects? 
It is. Yeah. So right. So right now, Mike, the customer I have is 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 a is the is the hotel Fairfield. I think it is there on Two Cummins. They don't use, um, you know, maybe five hundred thousand kilowatt hours a year. And so primarily, what we're doing is and that's a that's a customer of mine in my electricity brokerage, Geary Hotels. They own twenty five hotels in Maine. So we're we're looking to site fuel cell projects uh, on some of their locations. And so when you site a project like this, you're looking for uh, mostly the availability of the grid. You're looking for pockets of energy demand that these can simply plug and play. You don't want to put these in areas where there's either no room on the grid, uh, meaning that you'd have to upgrade conductor and poles and wires to get them to fit. So you sort of slide them into place. So generally speaking, these are in some of the bigger, you know, you know, demand areas of the state, Portland, South Portland, Scarborough, Saco, Biddeford, places like that. Um, so the rule is written, the rule is written, we can't export more than 200% of say the host of the hotel. So at 500,000 kilowatts, we're limited to a couple million kilowatt hours. Okay, so Maine's CMP's rules prevent sale of that electricity. So would you be tying to other meters? No, no, the, the, the CMP, so the process to interconnect with CMP is it's an interconnection application going to a queue. It's a distribution queue. So they manage the entire, they'll do an entire system impact study on the output of this facility. CMP doesn't care what you do with the power. You can sell it. You can have a bilateral transaction. You can sell it via ISO New England to a, to a third party through a financial transaction. You can simply export it to the grid and collect a wholesale power rate. Um, and so CMP doesn't get away of the market-based side of the energy sales. Um, so it's really that you just, you apply with CMP to get permission to, uh, and understand the impact to the grid. If there's any upgrades needed, reclosers, stuff like that down, down in the system. Um, so they don't, they don't get in the way of, they allow you to export whatever you want to the grid. Okay, so that's different than the homeowner situation. This is a commercial situation that I just don't have any experience with. Okay. Ernie. Um, so you said it'll run off of natural gas. Are there natural gas lines already at the location that you're considering going to, or would you have to put in new lines? Uh, for, my, for me, they're, they're existing. Although Unitil is a, has been a great partner with us. Unitil, um, you know, is, is willing to uh, bring gas service to other areas. So if there's an if there's an area where there's not generally gas service within say a mile, they will bring it and expand their distribution system for homeowners and everybody can then pick it up. As long, if there's a fuel cell, so like an anchor tenant, there's a fuel cell project, they'll bring it in at, at their own cost, at Unitil's own cost. And um, and that would expand their their reach if uh, if there was another community that wanted gas but couldn't justify Unitil spending the money. And uh, Mike, I'll let you speak for your own project. Yes, similar. Uh, there's already um, a pipe running right up the road. So, can you talk about the size of the equipment relative to the production? Can can, can we go back to slide okay. two to to look at the Deb's yeah. question? Can we? Can you go? Can you pull up slide two? Like just a comparison. Uh, this Wasn't one. Wasn't it slide two? Yes, yeah, yeah. that one. Yeah. So one of those boxes in that array. What's the production of one of those boxes? Like a, like a row. Is it, is it a whole row? There are... I think the other slide shows the, the segment pieces to go to the next yeah. one. This one. Yeah. Okay. So that's yes. the production of that server, for example. Yeah. So this this uh, system over here, the 14 or 15 foot by, uh, set by eight, nine feet, um, this is about a 325 kilowatt building block. So from a power density perspective, this one megawatt project for a fuel cell is kind of in the ballpark of 2,000, 2,500 square feet. And to give you some you know, comparison points for solar, that's somewhere between five and seven acres of space. So the goal of these is really to be in the nooks and crannies of commercial industrial properties that are already developed. You know, It's basically additional upside to the community. Five to seven acres, is that what you said? No, no, that would be no. the equivalent. The equivalent. The so power generator. Okay. So how? 2,500 square feet. So that, okay. And there's no setback? There's no like additional? 
Mm. You know? So well, then they're recite planning, then right, that's yeah. where you talk about that stuff. Yeah. 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 We have these um, basically right up against, you know, Home Depot's, grocery stores. People have picnics right next to them. They're actually um, very safe. Like they're all self enclosed. Um, so you don't need fences or things like that. I mean, obviously we can put them up if that's important, but we don't need to. And we have them all over shopping centers all over the US. And our current code requires them to be enclosed. That's correct. And would we not consider their case an enclosure? Would we require a building? What does enclosed mean? Uh, a fence or some sort of structure. You could do it with landscaping, but they have to be screened and hidden from view, and they probably need to be behind the building. Um, I think one of the proposals has it on an open part of the, of the lot, and that would meet our requirements. Okay. Were the purposes of our requirements visual or mm -hmm. something? Visual else? and safety. Okay. We require all um, any sort of condenser units or any sort of mechanical to be screened and behind. So. Okay, can, I, can I ask a question about the basic chemistry here? <laughs> um, doing, just doing a little background reading, it was my understanding that the byproduct of the fuel cells, oxygen, I'm sorry, is heat and water. I mean, you, you mentioned CO2. How, 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 where, where? So it I, would be that would be true if it was a hydrogen sourced fuel cell, but the hydrogen has to come from somewhere. No, so I in their proposal they're using natural gas. Okay, when, when you use when you use natural gas for this, where is the CO two coming from in terms of the in terms of a byproduct? The carbon from the natural gas. Yeah, so the CH3 will be cracked, and then you'll have a CO and a CO2 component, um, and then you'll take the remaining hydrogen and react it. Sort of along the same lines, you said that these energy servers can be converted, the, the fuel that goes into them can be converted from natural gas to hydrogen. Does that mean a wholesale swap out of the of the server, or is it a minimal change to it's it's pretty minimal. Uh, I'm just curious down the road. Yeah, no, it's a pretty minimal swap. It's similar to what we do kind of over the course of the life of the project, every like I said, five, six something years. Um, we'll basically take a pork truck, pull out one of the, the fuel cell systems. And by the way, it'll still be running. We don't even have to turn these off, but we'll we'll pop it out. We'll plug in a new one, let it start running again. It's a very similar idea. Um, we will actually change some upstream systems. So within this box, not all of them are full of fuel cells. Some of them have some other components related to kind of cleaning up the gas supply a little bit, stuff like that, trying to get some impurities out. Um, we'll actually we'll remove that, that stuff. Uh, it, we'll probably leave the boxes there. So from like a visual external perspective it'll all look exactly the same but you know we'll, we're talking about a couple of days worth of work at the most is the gas the natural gas line do you have to boost it or reduce it from the street pressure mm, it depends on where exactly in the network you are um, the closer you are to a transmission line the higher the pressure may be um, but generally every every site location I know at least I've been talking about Pete you can you can jump in Within Maine, it's just been able to use the street pressure. We're not using a uh, compressor or anything like that on site. Yeah, I, I can confirm that. I'm working with Unitil. Um, I've looked at probably 30 sites and just checking natural gas service. Um, and the only area of the state that, that well, the only area that Unitil operates where there's some old cast iron pipe that runs at about two PSI, which is fine for residential. Um, the modern gas lines that they have are suitable for 15 PSI, which is what these uh, fuel cells need. So that's regular roadside service, um, regular distribution service. In a lot of locations, I have a site in Auburn where we're just tapping into the service that goes into the building already. And it's the same flow rates and everything that we need. There's some areas around the tanks in South Portland that's, um, it's got some old cast iron pipe, but you know, there's just nothing to justify for them at this point to replace that. But that's what these projects bring as well as the ability for the, the gas company to come in and, and modernize their their own grid in a way. Yeah, but that's on the backs of the ratepayers. Let's be let's be fair on that. They're not gonna do, they're not gonna do it free. Well, no, there's not it's not free, but we sign a we sign an agreement with Unitil to as a customer. 
So we're going to use about 60,000 decatherm a year in gas. So because of that commitment to Unitil, we have a financial commitment to them. It's our, actually our, it's because of our customer anchor agreement that they're able to do that. So they sort of finance it for us. So instead of charging us the half million bucks, we pay it over time as part of our anchor agreement. So you would so would Bloom Energy be owning this facility or this generation, and you would then be an aggregate to businesses to uh, you know get them to purchase your your product. Like uh, yeah, no. So Bloom owns no uh, projects in the field. So our seven hundred megawatts, you know, six hundred sites out in the field, um, we do not own any of them. So we do bring in uh, private capital to own and operate these facilities. They're big names that you're used to, ranging from like a, a, a J.P. Morgan type. Uh, bank or business to, you know, other infrastructure uh, uh, owners. But um, Bloom is the uh, only O&M provider. So Bloom will be involved in the project until the end of life. Like I said earlier, we do take in those components, we do recycle them. Uh, and there is a significant, um, you know, interest in recycling those materials to us. So uh, we're never going to walk away from these projects, but we won't technically be the owners of them. And for, for my projects, um, we're looking at bringing in partial tax equity, but it's of the opinion that the, the hotel group I work with, Geary Hotels, that we will own these long term. Um, but uh, we may bring in some, we'll obviously bring in some lending service, debt service, and, and potentially some tax equity. You said you would own them long term. Who's the you? Uh, Old Coast and Geary. I'm my, one of my partners, equity partners on this is Geary. So I, I self fund all the developments along with my par equity partner, Geary Hotels. So Gary is the hotel owner at that two Cummins location. They own the Hilton Garden by the Jet Port. They own, like I said, around 25 hotels in Maine. Um, so we're collectively, we're the owners of the projects that I'm representing. What's been your typical cost? Oh, I'm sorry. Ron, go ahead, Ron. Sorry. All right. I've, I've got several questions. I guess the first and maybe the most important is, if the 200% number was changed to another number, what number would make you happy? Personally, I don't understand the 200% applicability. I understand that there was a the talk initially at the call that you want to limit it so it's not transmission type generation. Well, that's not that's not what we're doing anyway. I mean, you could do, I mean, ISO really doesn't get involved on a transmission level until you hit really above 10 megawatts of nameplate. So at these levels, they're all going to be distribution. They're all going to be absorbed in the immediate area, no matter what. You don't have a choice. Um, that's so, just the, I mean. so the 200% doesn't impact you or you want it to be unlimited? It does impact because you're limiting how much you can export. My point is the reason for the 200%, I don't, I don't understand personally the reason for it. If there was a reason that you wanted to, uh, to keep these smaller and so that they were on the distribution grid, so you're not having large power plants put in, that... The 200% achieves that, but it makes it so much smaller that you can't really have a feasible project. So even a one megawatt fuel cell, <clears throat> by nature of a, of, a, of a power generation, is extremely small. I mean, these, these, are, these are tiny. I mean, they're, they're, ISO really doesn't even care about these because they're, because they're absorbed in the local area, ISO doesn't even get involved. These are just handled strictly at the utility level. So um, the 200% impacts us because now you're tied, when you site these locations, it's very hard to site these in areas because you need, obviously, you know, we look, we're looking at zoning, we're looking at land, even though it's only 2,000, 2,500 square feet, the interconnection is the single most important hurdle that we face. And that's, that's dealing with poles and wires. It has to be three phase because these projects are small in nature. You can't afford any substantial upgrades, even to the distribution system. So if you had a, if you had three phase that was half a mile away, these out have to be three phase, you know, type uh, interconnections. You wouldn't be able to afford to do a project because that would be a million dollars of upgrades that you'd have to pay for to CMP. So you really got to connect to existing three phase. There has to be um, enough of that three phase circuit available, the right size, uh, the right reclosers. There's a lot that goes into siting these. And so when you're limited to the host facility being the size of it, the 200% works for, for these size systems if you have a really large, extremely large user. And so you just, you don't see, I mean, I, I've been in electricity sales for 15 years. There's probably only 
a handful of customers in Scarborough that use more than 10 million kilowatt hours a year. Um, so it's just, it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's hard to cite everything you need to do with a grid and then find a customer that says, okay, you need it right here. That's really, that's really our point behind it. So, so what you're, I just, I trying to get to a, a simple answer of you need to have the 200% totally removed or you need to have it changed to some other number. Yeah. If it was a number, it'd have to be significantly higher. I mean, we're, again, cause it, you can't get a, you can't put a percentage to it. Cause then it, 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 it being removed would be the best because okay, if you keep you. something thank in there. Thank you for that. Thank yeah. you for that answer. Well, I'm just saying that's that the answer is, is contingent the on the host. The answer yeah. is always going to be contingent on the customer you're partnered with. So. All right. Um, my next question is. Ron, we, we've got we to gotta move on a little bit. So uh, let's keep the answer somewhat short. To Yeah. So when have you questions. have admissions, how, do you, how are the admissions admitted from the site? Is there a. a one location that it comes out of is it how does it work so can you guys see my mouse on the screen yep so you see this uh darker area in the system right here yeah yep that's where we exhaust our our output okay um if you were to move to hydrogen you would need to have a storage tank or what is your thoughts about how you will do hydrogen? No, so that'll be a similar thing where we're just going to consume hydrogen from the grid like we do natural gas today. And uh, we would, in that case, just be venting basically like water. Uh, no, no. Where would you, I mean, you're, you're saying down the road we can move to hydrogen. How yeah. are you expecting the hydrogen to be provided? Uh, via the current gas supply. Okay, thank you. Yep. Can I ask one last question? Are there any safety considerations for this? Uh, there absolutely are. And that's why we go through uh, exhaustive UL testing and similar. You know, any utility equipment is going to have uh, safety considerations. Uh, we have these cited in, you know, downtown New York City. And, and that's one of the most uh, strict fire, fire marshal regulations in the United States. And we've sailed through that permitting process. So uh, I'm happy to prepare a package of you know details and all that information, but at a high level, um, we've thought a lot about this and these are inherently extremely safe. All right, well, uh, thank you for that. Are you going to share those slides with Jamie? Because there were some footnotes or some references that I couldn't read and uh, I'd like to take a look at it. But uh, Appreciate your presentation this morning. And it's interesting technology and you know, on-site generation is is really, you know, I, I think personally an appropriate step to take if we try to clean up our grids. Um so with that, maybe we'll have you know future discussions on this and look at the slides. And I think we had to revisit the ordinance a little bit so we can get a little bit better understanding. Yeah. All right. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank all. you. Bye. 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 Yes. It would be nice to get a handle on why the two hundred percent. I have a feeling first place. that it was because when this went into effect, like renewable energy on site was such a new thing, and it wasn't well regulated at the state, and there were so many concerns about people. What's it going to look like? That's always tends to be the. When, when did this go? When 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 was this? I remember this. this like, the energy committee was involved in this, and it was exactly a, we don't want somebody to set up a um, industrial scale solar right. array, which and, we've shifted our position on. We and now it's it's better regulated by the state and by CMP yeah. and what they what yeah. they can. When did we put the, when was this, this order? The, the standards for the small scale energy facilities were adopted in June of 2012. So. I mean, perhaps we can go back and uh, and that was somewhat that. because of the trigen that we were. We yeah, were I think I was on the committee yeah. being put in. I have yeah. no recollection. Yeah, of this I'm either. remembering the conversations. It was very much not wanting to full scale get into people turning their properties into 
energy production facility. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and so it was like, so, and it was, that was a random number. It was like, okay, no more than twice <laughs> were, a were, like, were we discussing TriGen at this time? Or well, TriGen came after this, didn't it? Yeah, it did. I think this was more about wind. Uh, yeah, was, no one wants to see wind turbines and stuff. Yeah, it was also yeah. about yeah. Solar, and some solar, yeah. Yeah, yeah and I remember Paul was was involved in some of that. Paul Audrey and, so and, and the governor's office. Tri-Gen in some other places. Yeah, as well, and we're just trying to hold back on the scale. Kind of on the scale of it. So it sounds like maybe next steps for us is we can bring the ordinance and its specific things, and you all can give us some input on what we should remove yeah. or tweak or change, and then we can go from there. Yeah, it sounds like probably. It sounds like this is something we want. We think it's a good idea in Scarborough. That's what we really wanted. You know, yeah, I think that's we I, I think, are interested okay. in um, allowing, then we can definitely fix the ordinance to make it so. Well, yeah. so I think we should all for sure. So. Okay. Yeah. Great. Okay, right. perfect. And that's what we'll just go with that. I think we can pretty quickly move that through. I, I, I just faster think. than the EV ordinance. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I just think that the public though would would ask a question about safety. Mm -hmm. I mean, are these systems safe? They're going to be more safe than a combustion. Yeah, yeah no, I, I, get, I get it. And we do allow a combustion. I, 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 but nuclear is non combusted too. So, yeah, no, I, <laughs> yeah, I know the, the hydrogen is not being burnt or anything else like that. But, I, but I'm just thinking the average person who doesn't know anything about this would, would just say, is this something safe to have? Do you know what I mean? Will it blow up? Yeah, will it blow up, in other words? Mm. Just, just to paraphrase the discussion so far, I think the 200% limit is proportional to the amount of space that the project takes up. These take up much less space than a solar array. Yeah. So if that would help the public understand things that- Yeah, I think that's good content. Space economics. Mm -hmm. so yeah, <clears throat> micro generation is great on site. Well, you know, I it's I think what I would like to think through is the more detailed concept of commercial sites producing more electricity than they're using. Right. And I just need some time to think through that in my head and what that might look like and whether we want to have different types of rules for different technologies or if there is a blanket rule we can apply or like I, I just need some time to think this through mm -hmm. myself. Well, and would it be helpful to have the slides also so that you can look at some of the background information that they reference? In their Maybe, slides? and I just so. want to, I pulled their website because I wanted to stick to the technology. I, I think it would also be interesting to know what is the CO2 emissions compared to generating electricity. Their site and source too. So Straight away with natural gas. Um, well, they said 17% reduced, 17 and that's what I want to look at as well. Is that what that? Yeah. That was on one of those. Well, they reference where they get that from, yeah, so, so I, and I couldn't read right. that and more. And that was like per megawatt system. So it's, theoretically, each system can have up to, a, and I think it was up to 17% reduction. I don't think it was straight across. Probably the depends on what the technology is that you're comparing it to. Yeah. So I want what I want to see is the efficiency numbers rather than that 17% yeah. reduction. And they also botched the chemistry, which bothered me a tiny bit, but not a lot. Um, <laughs> yeah, I was starting I can see your sensitivity to that. It was yeah, C4 I was, and C3. I, I was caught up on the chemistry too. Um, but then you mentioned that they're generally using natural gas to generate it. So that that so, makes sense because there's no carbon. Well, the nat the carbon is the natural gas. I know. Okay. I know. So that it, it's a two-phase process is what I need to go right. back and look at. So the stacks of cells are not using uh, natural gas. Right, the natural, the natural gas, gas is fueling is a different, the... different part of the system. system. And that natural gas then is being converted to carbon dioxide mm -hmm. and hydrogen that they're feeding into the system. And so that's what I want to understand a little bit more about. Yep. So, yeah. All right, so we are way over time at yeah, the moment. Yeah. So. Um, I can give, I think we can just do a brief update on the EV charging ordinance just to let you all know that that's going before the planning board next week for the public hearing. So, um, December 12th. December, oh, December 12th. I keep thinking we're in December. I know, it's not quite. Yeah, no, December 12th. Do you 12th. need any of us for that or are they set? Um, Rick will be representing at the planning board. Um, 
it's always helpful to have positive voices at planning board because I feel like if anything that we've learned from the solar ordinance, people are going to get up and say whatever they want, whether it's true or, or not. And it would be helpful to have counter residents countering some of those voices. So if people are available on Monday the 12th at 6.30, um, that would be helpful. I have conservation commission that night, so I will not be there. I'm going to be honest. Yeah. So, and even if no one gets up to speak about it, having someone there to uh, to counter some of this stuff, because there was a lot of misinformation with the solar ordinance that um, it would have been helpful, I think. Fortunately, it didn't derail the process. But. I have another meeting there as well, but the primary thing that they were arguing about last time was multifamily dwellings and the assumption that those poles would be fixed for multifamily dwellings and they don't need to be. Right. Uh, so I won't be there, but if you have right. that information to say, there's a way that they can do that, just stop. And I don't know if everyone has heard the news, but South Portland just passed their EV charging ordinance. Yeah. So um, so we don't have to be the first. We're yeah. not the first. And uh, I think that will be. <laughs> I know. I'm but sorry. we don't like to be the first. We try. Why not? <laughs> if you're not first, the view never changes. I <laughs> well, it's a dog, you know, it's a slow sled dog. It's a sled dog. If you're not the lead, your view never changes. Um, anyway, that's good news. Um, certainly, I hope my colleagues on the planning board will read the ordinance and understand it. But, uh, and understand that. I think I've warned them up but as we've gone through this. I've brought it up several times. So, um, I think it's good. And I've actually brought it up to a couple of pre-apps we've had with hotels, which is the biggest impact. And they've been like, okay. You know, so they know it's coming. They know it's coming. Yeah. yeah. And they're yeah. used to it in other areas mm -hmm. of the country. So how, how, how is the downs gonna get around the EV ordinance? <laughs> They're not. I'm sorry. I mean, let's I'm move on. on. Let's move on. That's, that's, not, a that's not a political. Yeah, I mean, the way it I mean, works. It's not going right now, it's just as the ordinance reads, they have to pay a impact fee. And that was one comment from the council in first reading was they yeah. don't really like the impact fee idea. I did have an opportunity to um, just touch base with John Anderson afterwards because um, he was the one that was saying that. And I did share that our impact fees will actually cost more than someone just yeah. installing um, the stuff. So he seemed to, to like that idea. Um, and then the other item was they wanted um, any impact fees or in lieu fees, I should say, not impact fees, in lieu fees collected to maybe go towards things other than EV charging. So other sustainability initiatives. Which I think would be nice because it's right. in our energy or comprehensive plan, we were going to get a percentage and they didn't, and it was up to the town council to determine that percentage, but they've never gone that way. Yeah. We made recommendations, but they never made. But if we could get them to agree that the impact fees would go for initiatives brought forth by the town and then met the definition of whatever we have in our plan. So at this point, I think to change, make any changes to the ordinance, um, it would need to be done through a council amendment. So um, April, I think, is listening in. Um, so we can chat about possibly if, if there's interest in the with the council of, of directing some of the in lieu fee to um, to other just a sustainability fund that that might be um, an amendment that can be introduced. I'd like to just lift that entirely, like to lift the charger piece mm -hmm. entirely because it feels like there's money coming from other places for chargers, and to instead say that that's money to be directed by the sustainability of the commission or something like that. Okay, so yeah. I can. Oh, go ahead. Hi guys. Um, I definitely think that there is. Um, a want on the council to kind of get our arms around a lot of these fees um, and, and who pays in lieu fees and what the account balances are and what that money is designated to be spent on. I think that that's something that the council does not really have a good handle on right now. And so any recommendations that you guys have as a committee that could kind of come as like, this is, this is currently what's happening. This was the reason for it. This is the change we'd like to see and just keep it as 
you know, clear cut as possible. I think that that that's definitely something I don't know whether that conversation will happen at finance or whether it will be a council goal for the year. But that's definitely a reoccurring theme right now is to get our arms around all these these different fees. Thanks, April. All right, moving on. Moving on, I feel like we should maybe table Sustainable Scarborough Day and, and take yeah, that up next month. We'll I will up next month. I will just share that Conservation Commission is super excited and interested to um, to work on this um, with this group. As and I've spoken with um, Steffi Cox at Project Grace, and she's super excited about it as well. So there's a lot of and interest. we're talking about like doing this around Earth Day. Like around Earth Day. So it's April time frame. Yeah. So okay. So um, uh, I would recommend, and you guys can give this some thought, kind of forming a, a subcommittee to kind of work on this and work jointly with a uh, conservation commission um because we won't be able to do this just in meetings so it'll be a little bit of an additional lift for that um so next we'll um talk um have autumn share the gmo stuff um you want me to pull up your presentation oh, sure or? sure and if you'll go through it if you'll do the oh, and, I, and, and yeah. pass it up, i'll take notes on the answers <laughs> so do you oh, you're printing copies yes. oh nice <laughs> Um, and I appreciate you all kind of rearranging your agenda. Just, oh, no, that's but the uh, council wants the something, uh, the council gets it. So, in October, and I'm sure you all are, know a little bit about our growth management ordinance, it's been a hot topic for the uh, past year. The downs wanting an exemption and different ways to play out. And what happened in October is the council came up with a solution for the downs moving forward, but they said no more exemption requests. And so John Anderson and Nate McGee were tasked um, with, um, they are working with Tom Hall, myself, and Karen Martin, and Sedco to come up with some proposals for a new GMO revision, how we looked at it, how we mm -hmm. issued growth permit. And so part of our outreach, we're um, Put this survey together for all of the boards and commissions in the town, town departments, and then some outside people as well, trying to get some ideas from your perspective as the sustainability group, what the GMO means to you. And some of these you may say that doesn't matter to us. It, it's not important, or you may have a you know a really big impact to know. So these questions uh, are meant to be answered as the group and I will take back, um, I'm collecting answers. We did Transportation Commission last night and it took about two hours. So I will say uh -oh. <laughs> we had a lot of other good transportation um, topics discussed, but hopefully it won't take quite so long and we can kind of stay on task with it. Um, we don't have another meeting between now and yeah. when it's due. It, exactly. And so we have this, you know, Christmas Eve Eve deadline that yeah. we're trying to accomplish. So um, would really like to get through it. Um, in this, you can follow along, but the GMO, it's a four or five page ordinance, but in a nutshell, it's, it's got three components. And so there's allocation, and that is a set number of permits that are allocated per year. And every two to three years, the council updates it, and it's a percentage increase over the last 10 year average. So right now we have 144 um, growth permits allowed. But within that 144, there's some limits. So right now, um, you can only do 30 permits in the rural district, and those are all the districts basically west of the turnpike. And then there's a percentage um, cap on unified development, so 20%, and then for the Crossroads Plains District, 30%. So what that means is that if someone, a uh, developer came in and said, hey, I want to do 300 apartment units, I want to build them over the next two years, they wouldn't be able to get enough growth permits because they wouldn't be able to get 20, 20% would be too many. Um, so that's something that comes up with the allocation and the way that's written. There's also some exemptions written in. And the exemptions are pretty straightforward. Um, things like repair and replacement, affordable housing units, uh, manufactured housing, and those are in our licensed districts already. And then currently we have up to 101 bedroom units that are exempt. It's a time limit on those. And then the downs, uh, the crossroads plan development, this is what was done in October to appease that exemption request, the 289 mixed use of multifamily. And then the third part of the GMO is the exemption process. 
And this is the tricky one because it's tied to public benefit. And public benefit has been very subjective and not well defined. And so there's some questions in here to get your input on what public benefit is in terms of sustainability. So the first question, um, and this is just not thinking about growth or any, you know, anything really, but when you meet as a group and when you, you talk about things you want to do for the town of Scarborough, does the number of new residential units have an impact on your decision making? Does that uh, mean something? You know, does you say, oh, if we get 100 new residential units, it means we can afford X or it means ooh, we have this problem. Does it have any sort of impact on sustainability? Well, I think density certainly has an impact. So not the total number. The, the, you know, yeah, yeah, the density. Of <laughs> the location and proximity to Route 1, traffic problems are getting worse. That's so, another consideration. Can't talk about traffic. <laughs> <laughs> you had enough last night. But that is a yes. consideration because. But the infrastructure piece beyond, I mean, the roads are a piece of the infrastructure. Um, but whether or not the proposed site has infrastructure and what the other modifications might be, certainly has an impact on the other stuff. And does it. Does it change the way you think if it's single family or multifamily? Definitely. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. how so? Uh, I guess the impervious area is is a concern um, when it comes to multifamily because now you're talking parking lots and, and those kind of things. So the the land. You talk about water runoff. Right. But there are efficiencies. Yeah, there's pluses and minuses. But so. yeah, from a sustainability, uh, you know, certainly. That, but also it's it's I was the, inclined to preference the multifamily development because of the density, the density and the infrastructure piece, but the parking lot is a totally separate thing. I'm not sure if you would all driveways. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, but it, it it's something we consider. Yeah. Yeah, I was gonna say all the rooftops. I mean, you've got sta a stacked building, mm -hmm. like how many if you fit that the same number of people well, in houses. How they do their multifamily. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's true. That. That's true. And then, so yeah, things like the infrastructure attachment, okay. surfaces, um, and not necessarily like traffic, but vehicle related, the number of vehicles on the road, the emissions from those vehicles mm -hmm. and, and things like that, that all plays into my thinking. There, there are a lot of indirect impacts too from that, you know, it's the impact on the schools, the amount of construction that has to go on to support new residents. Please. Again, outside of a lot, lot of things. So, you know, yeah. It, yeah, it, I think it all it all redounds back to this notion of what do you mean by sustainability? Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I mean, I mean, you can come up with uh, you can quantity, well, we might want to try to quantify it in certain ways, but there are certain qualitative aspects. Do it as well. So, can you go to question eight for me? This happened last night too. So, question eight. I mean, I mean, crowding, crowding in sure. general is a stressor on society. Mm -hmm. It is. So, these are this is a guiding principle question, and so this is you know, as the sustainability, what um, what overarching principles really guide your committee when you make decisions? What made you say, oh, this? This alternative energy is a good option. What what principles do you really apply? Well, we have that other document that we mm -hmm. worked on with the uh, um, conservation mm -hmm. commission that you have. Yes, yeah. That really defines like we would. I personally would like to encourage certain kinds of development that fit some of those principles. Okay. Um, and so I would rather see. Uh, Low energy footprint multi family dwelling than 15 standard stick built houses um, from a sustainability perspective. So, are you all interested in how they're built? Like the lead standards, or to, I mean, is that something that's, well, that's really important to us mm -hmm. because we added that in the comp plan? And yeah, 
Yeah, it's in the comp plan and it was in the, the memo to the council. Well, and now we've been told we can write ordinance about this. Stuff. <laughs> Watch me go. But we have to talk about the first. first. Okay. Um, except we can't because by the time we write them, they'll call us out. It's um, not being so negative all the oh, time. Stop it. Um, Change is tough. So, what other things, you know, do you really look at <clears throat> when you um, consider? something in this group you know why did you decide ev charging was going to be the way to go well market trends are you know what's happening out there in the marketplace what 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 technology is going on so new so technology advancement. is advancing with so that's a good one we have to stay up because we want to use new opportunities to make things better yeah i'm tr i'm going back to used in our uh plan what our definition of sustainability was and that's something like do no harm uh, kind of aspect where, yeah, there is a, there is an impact in, in any built environment, but are there things to offset that can, are there things that can be used to offset what impact those things are doing right. and kind of come out as, you know, almost like a net zero or something of that nature. And that's, that's a good, you know, so to me that's more important than the number of units is the quantity of impact. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, and maybe even the ratio of impact. <laughs> like, right. Um, how many residents and how much impact or something like that. So let's go back to question five. And so five um, is about the exemption process. And so the question is, do you think an exemption process is beneficial to the town? And this exemption process, the way it's written, is through council. And a project needs to, and so this would be something if we run out of growth of it. So we run out of the 144. It's a new project that requires more uh, growth permits. They can go to town council and they have to be part of the mixed use or multifamily. They have to be in the designated growth area, which is essentially Route 1, which coincidentally is where our traffic <laughs> really is. Um, and so, and they have to provide public benefit. And so this question is just, do you think this exemption process is a good idea or um, should it be something that's handled in a different way? And you don't have to have a strong opinion on it if it's not something you've ever really, oh, it's okay, but the next part, the public benefit part is probably the part. That I think that's the part. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not against exemption. Okay. But what do we get out of what that? Do we get out of that? You know, what what's the give and take? You want something, what are you gonna do that that meets our our goals? And I think there has to be some sort of exemption process because I don't think yeah. that we can decide today, like I don't think we can predict the future well enough right. to understand like if somebody were to come in with a really cool proposal that would really make housing more sustainable and provide a huge set of public benefits, but it needs to be done at a scale that you can't. You know. So the exemption process is fine as long as we really understand what we're doing. And as long as they're, they're required to account for other costs that the town will town incur. Um, I, I think personally, though, an exemption process only makes sense if it's judiciously applied. If you grant exemptions willy-nilly, mm -hmm. Then why do you even have a chief growth management ordinance? Mm -hmm. yeah, you know, I mean, if there's, I mean, it just every other week you can't be granting an exemption, and they have to be well thought out. I think that process maybe needs to provide opportunities for committee input. Like we were seriously irritated last time that our presentation on the document we put together was not addressed until after they just made the decision. Sure, we have 10 to 15 committees and boards, and so yeah, using those. And we're thinking about different sorts of things, sure. and if we, if we need a chance. To yeah, we need a chance the to, question. To, to educate the council before they make that decision on, yes, this is an appropriate use of having an exemption. And so, um, six is definitely yes, so go to seven. I'm sorry. Uh -huh. um, there's, could an exemption 
process have as a top priority serving the public good in some way? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. absolutely think but, so. But it's, is that is that spelled out in here? I don't know, no, not currently. And, and I think that's, and I think that's where they want to get to. Yeah, right. and I was going to say it seems like the public that it needs to be defined, which has been talked about. Like, I mean, anybody can come in and make some sort of pitch for how their development is going to benefit the public, but the town should look to its comp plan and things like that to understand what is important to the town in terms of public benefit. And those should be the things that the developers. Yeah, and there's all, you know, and if, if there is an exemption process and I would, my brain kind of simplifies things like there's these buckets, right? And each bucket, there's a sustainability bucket, there's a conservation bucket, there's a transportation bucket, and there's parks and community services. And your project needs to get some points in all of those to really have this overarching public benefit. If, you know, last night it came up so far, what we usually hear, oh, we're going to build sidewalks and a trail connection. Well, that's already required. So there's no very right. good for you. You did what was needed, but let's do extra. And so that's, if I think if we keep this exemption process part of this questionnaire with all these different groups, we'll have a really good public benefit fine, hopefully. Um, and so we can figure out how what those thresholds are and what it really means. And it's not just somebody saying, we're, we're just good and it's going to be great and you're going to love us. It's yeah, quantified. I, mean, I just think the bar for exemptions has to be high. High. Right. Has, has to be high. Well, it, yeah. And if, it, and if it's not high, it's going to be perceived by me and others as, as just a political exercise. Mm -hmm. the, this group of people has a little bit more in with the town management or the town council than anybody else does. So they can get their project pushed through. So, also with the public. Yeah. Yeah. People. Defer to oh, we need a new grocery store, we need more housing for this or that category. Um, some the developers in any in any uh, small economy carry a certain amount of weight, and Always. the public accepts it before groups like this talk about it. Yeah, the applicant bears the responsibility of meeting. What we define as public mm -hmm. so it's benefit, not their definition of it. Mm -hmm. So it's my understanding that the growth management ordinance was developed with an understanding of what that growth entails for the mm -hmm. town and how we can manage. Mm -hmm. And so, to accelerate that growth process, they should they should take on the extra cost, cost. of accelerating the services mm -hmm. in addition to okay. to what's required. To, Making yeah. it better. Right. right. Well, if, believe it or not, the growth management ordinance was put in place to manage growth. Ha ha. You know? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> no, you play on uh, words. As, as, <laughs> as, shock, as shocking as that seems. But if you're if you're providing exemptions all the time for a lot of different reasons, and since no one can define public benefit, I mean we could we could have a long philosophic conversation about what what What's public benefit? You come back to some of the weakest excuses for for development, and I, those of us who have lived in other places see how this is just a steady creep, a steady march on. And one day you're there, and you go, "Where is all of my farmland? Where are my trees? What in the hell happened? Why is the water so polluted?" And some of us come from places that were averaging a thousand calories per day. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I do have some concerns with the way the growth management ordinance is set up. It does make it exceedingly difficult for a large multifamily mm -hmm. uh, project to go in. I think there are good reasons to consider large multifamily projects. Um, there are exemptions for um, affordable housing. That's a very specific definition. So sort of that next tier of housing is also critical in providing services in town and some of that housing feels like it needs to be in multifamily developments and if you can only get 20 percent of 144 in any given year you're going to be hard right. to do that right and so i'm not sure how to address that okay. um but i think that's a common thing too is our comp plan says we want these things but then we're limiting it here but then we're right you know we're mm -hmm. we're not quite sure so I think we're trying to get it all in a line. Um, that's the goal. So 
when you all think about public benefit, um, what does public benefit mean from a sustainability standpoint? So would it mean um, a public benefit, something special, right? So if I was a developer and I was bringing a project in and I came and presented to you all, and I said, this is my project, it's great, it's, you know, 25 single family homes and I'm gonna do X, Y, Z. What would you all want me to do to show public benefit from a sustainability standpoint? Energy needs to be significantly lower than would otherwise be expected. Uh, yeah. Less, less impervious surfaces or ways to manage that impervious surface water. Um, I mean, we've made this list. No, I'm I'm waiting for Rick to say distributed generation of power. Well, micro micro <laughs> yeah. micro grid. So that's a, a. Do you have this list in existing part? It's right? kind of in our energy plan and. I mean, if there's something you can just send me, I can use that too. You don't have to read it if you have it already thought out. That's well, I think you're hitting most of the high. Uh, well, because it's been. I mean, we've been saying the same things for a decade right. now. And so I, I would resiliency, that. you know, making sure that um, because of growth, uh, other things happen, climate change, and then there's coastal water and begins to say, why are we putting generators on, you know, on the ground floor or ground because of, you know, floodplains and those kind of things. So resiliency in our built environment is important. And some of this is stuff we should be doing every time we develop, right. whether or not it's an exemption. Right. We're trying to move towards that. Right, right. But to part of the, I mean, part of the reason for the stay was to let the ordinances catch up to the comprehensive plan mm -hmm. and to grant this massive expansion, extension, whatever, sorry, um, before we had that opportunity, mm -hmm. it was just like, wait a minute, why did we even do all of that? So we tried to claw some of that back by asking that they at least have to follow the um, the, the electric car <laughs> ordinance that like we're on the cut boat and didn't well, even get a chance to ask for that. Well, so. but here's the thing: if once our ordinance goes into effect, I mean, they still, even though they got the um, their additional units, they still have to go through the planning board process. Mm -hmm. So once our ordinance is in okay. in place, they will be subject to that. Okay, so the the permits don't no that, that doesn't, doesn't preclude like them to hear no okay, I thought they that don't have any permits. Oh, okay. yeah really they like still that. need to go through planning board so any ordinance changes that happen before they're in front of planning board they are subject to all right let's get worked out yeah okay uh, so yeah, public benefit. And Jenny, can you give me that document? Yeah, I'll send you the okay. sustain energy and sustainability plan. Sure. Because this is not my wheelhouse and job. So. <laughs> um, I can't okay. figure out how to how to fit the discussion about taxes and school population growth into a growth maintenance ordinance. Because having watched this over the years, these things are, are the, the limitation is, is on a certain number of units per year. Mm -hmm. And that's cumulative mm -hmm. as time goes by. And now we have to build a new pool. And what? I don't I don't I don't personally know the, the relationship between well I think you've been needing to build a new school for some time. And I think that um some of the enrollment numbers are going down in the upper grades and going up a little bit and going lower. So I think the school, the school is definitely related to growth, but I don't think it's a definite cause and effect. I think there's, the, there's some interesting, like our population is getting older. So we're actually one of the older communities uh, in the area. So that's definitely less impact on school. Right, but that's an effect of but it's the housing type. The housing type. Right, because we, we've we been building 55 and older. Yeah, but for we were time. talking last night about, you know, a lot of um, empty nesters or older retirees are moving more into multifamily and condos, but then they open up the bigger single family for the family. So it's kind of an interesting, you, you school is hard because you think, oh, well, we'll just build one bedroom units 
what does that mean? But then if you do have that in migration that they talk about a lot, it's true because you open up a whole neighborhood of big homes for me and my four kids or whatever to move into. And so it's that's a piece of they need yeah. to be covering the cost of accelerating the service. The service yeah. Meaning school, yeah. meaning plows, meaning whatever else yeah. you need to buy. Yeah, all the services. The, the cost of services, services for yeah. everything. And so they need to be contributing a sizable chunk of cash for us to be able to accelerate. And Ron has his hand up. Go ahead, Ron. Yeah, I just was thinking that it, it seems like the people who come in late have to to go through a different wicket to get past. Is there, is there a reason why every one of these things that comes before um, a board or whatever shouldn't go through the same wickets? That they should have to have some public good, even though they were number one in the queue as opposed to number 145? That's a good point. Like if you come in last, you have to be special. But if you get, I mean, that's a great point. And I think that's part of the problem with the exemption process too, is, you know, there's um, ideally for my very idealistic, simplistic way of thinking, we should have ordinances in place that require all the things we want. We should have those in place. So when someone comes in, developer comes in, they know exactly what we want and exactly what they're going to be required to do and pay and they have that threshold and if they can do it they'll stay and if they can't they'll move on and then the town has knows that worst case scenario is a good scenario right um and so we're sort of playing catch up right now because we don't have our worst case scenario is not our is not a great scenario right now it's a kind of ooh, can you would you will you please sort of moment and so I think, and maybe if we had all that in place, maybe the exemption process, I don't know, maybe there's not a magic number at some point. I mean, that's part of the discussion too. Um, it's it's tricky. I come from a place where there's there's no magic number. There's just a lot of requirements. And so it, there's also a whole another world with land availability. Because there's not a ton of it. West of the Turnpike is pretty nailed down. We do a really good job with our zoning ordinance. Um, there's not, and the fact that we don't have utilities out there, that's, West of the Turnpike is really sort of protected in my mind, the way we, I think the last comp plan did a really good job with implementation with that. Um, so we're really focusing on that Route 1 growth corridor right now, and there's little pockets of land availability, but I think once we get to the point, um, where we get all of our ordinances in place, I think you're gonna see some changes. And I think that's what you, you know, you're like, we've been wanting this for so long, but I think you're at a really critical point with all these discussions that you can, you're gonna to start to get them. I really do. I think you're gonna to start to see these things come together. Um, and I think that's what, this is a really, you know, me being new here in New State, this is actually a really great project for me to get an understanding from all the different committees and boards of ongoing issues and thing, you know, failings, if you will, of things that we need to address. And so I'm pretty excited about this and being part of this discussion. We get this little number thing, but then all the other things that come out of it, I think you're gonna start to see. On the west side of the, of the turnpike though, you're subject to what your neighbors are doing. Sure. So if they start bringing in density, well, you, and then we're talking about the interconnected road you know in the south portland going for gorm and all that that could bring services uh to the other side now it could and, and so now you're looking yeah. at the growth coming from outside the boundaries in yeah and so if you go to question uh let's break my glasses so, uh it's about number go back go back Okay. This one. So, um, no, I'm sorry, go back one more for the annual allocation. So, right now we have no more than 30 permits in the rural district. And so, is that a number maybe that we need to maintain? I don't know if that's the magic number, but we need to maintain awareness that we want to limit that per year. Well, 30 plus 30 plus 30 plus 30. <laughs> I know it's 30 every year. year. Yeah, okay. it adds up for sure. And so, I mean, is that something? Um, is that 
A good thing that the DMO right now does limiting that. No, it certainly makes it manageable. I mean, it, that's the intent of the GMO. Yeah. Is. And so I think the longer term planning question is which of these areas should be built into housing and which of these areas should never be built into housing. And that's the battle between the, the land trust trying to grab things up as they become available, right? Which is what we've been doing so far. Mm -hmm. And so that was the Conservation Commission's question of. It's a zoning question, I think, of prioritizing the wildlife corridor. Right. Yeah. And they, the Conservation Commission has the goal of, of conserving an additional 7,000 acres of land in Scarborough by 2030, which is enormous. And if that's hap going to happen, the bulk of it is going to be west of the turnpike. Mm -hmm. And so um, folks getting exemptions have got to be buying that 10,000 acres that we can put into this lot. Like, um, to meet those goals, but that's not that, that's conservation. Sure. But, but it, it is great. related to sustainability yeah, as well. Right. Because right. we want them to be coastal. Mm -hmm. And not just like we'll not build on this particular swampy area that no one's letting ever build on. Anyway, right. right. Like it's not even feasible to build. Right. Now, asking a devil's advocate question why do you think developers would want to do that? Because it's cheaper. To, to if they what benefit do they get from developing and maybe they get an exemption process, but they go and purchase some conservation land. They can it. put their name on a piece of land and have a That's what I'm <laughs> and I'm not <laughs> so and they get to build. Figure they get out to build something and it's also a benefit okay. for them. And they get they get to build something they weren't otherwise going to get to build. I think that's the benefit that they get. So maybe that. What I'm trying to get to is like this this land purchase, that sort of thing, have a higher, if you were on a point I, system, I, I, would that be a higher ranked thing than, you know, something else? That's what I'm trying to I don't to. know that I can do that. I think that's like a town wide. Mm -hmm. I think you have to play tug of war and have all the different committees on the yeah, same boat. Yeah, yeah, whoever wins, you get some of the other benefits your way. Yeah. Yeah. How, to, yeah. how to weight that. Okay. okay. But, I mean, that's certainly a huge one because that's an important goal in the conference. Right. right. And with, but we can't do it if if this just proceeds a pace and when we do get right. an exemption, we don't it's take an extra problem. step towards that. Okay. Um, so let's see. So what do you think about so it sounds like the common scheme I heard from you, Deb, that, that doesn't seem like it's reasonable because you can't do a larger multi you might you know, wouldn't necessarily be able to do a larger project okay. without um, the exemption process. But that might be the right place for the exemption process. Okay. I mean, I don't know who wrote that number and I don't know why, so I'm not right. really sure what that <laughs> number in there. Um, but in reading this, I do raise a concern mm -hmm. that right. our conference plan talks about these kinds of housing, but it'd be very difficult. To very difficult on the way this is written. Sort of contradictory. Okay. So the next one about the exemptions, let's talk about exemptions and I think we'll be done. Uh, question four. Um, so some of these are pretty straightforward and I think they will probably remain. Right now we don't require a growth permit for repair and replacement units. That seems to uh, make sense. All affordable housing units right now. And so um, those are exempt across the board currently. Is that something we should keep? Do you think we should maybe further define? Oh, a, a, a consistent definition of what is affordable yeah. housing would be helpful. Well, we have a definition. It's the 80% of the median income thing. But we don't have a requirement to deed restrict it for any sort of time frame currently. So that, I mm. think, I mean, so that that's important. It's affordable. It can be affordable the first time, but if we don't write, um, and sometimes the bigger projects they have, they have to do. Um, yeah, like for main state housing, it's yeah. a certain amount of money that is allowed to be spent per unit. Right, right. To build. If it's a federal or a state sort of thing, you have something built in. Um, but if you were going to do affordable housing units in a larger scale subdivision, just dispersed, 
you know, it has to be written in sort of deed restrictions or something for some sort of time frame. So from my perspective, the goal there is that people who work at the grocery stores and people who work at the school and people who do these other things mm -hmm. can live near where they right. work, which is a sustainability issue mm -hmm. as to how much they need to drive and how much fuel they need to burn to get where they're going. And when our growth management rules are not resulting in development that allows that, we have a problem. Okay, so it sounds like the affordable housing unit is a good thing for exemptions from a well, sustainability as perspective. Long as it's oh, real. Real. It's right, as long as it's a real, yeah. fully made idea. Really that. But okay. then that's kind of combined with what's workforce housing. Mm -hmm. And so you get all affordable, and then you can only do get, ten. And work. I, and I don't housing. know where the number came from. I don't have a good um, grasp of that. And and workforce housing is changing too. It, it you know changes every year based on you know income. And then what businesses are brought into Scarborough nearby that, and what level of pay are those jobs? And you know if another uh, e-commerce comes up. You know, those aren't going to be $100,000 uh, a year salary jobs. Right. They're just not. So now do you say, all right, you're going to do affordable housing for them. Now you really suppress their income ability. and Or we say it's workforce housing. This is, you only get 10 of those, and this is going to need 50 employees. Mm -hmm. This is a really great group of people to get these ideas out. I always enjoy it, but I, I get caught up with the affordability question is, a, is answered by the developers when they build the places. But what about long-term affordability? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And utility costs. Um, so our standards for affordability seem to me are pretty big. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's affordable to buy, but it's not affordable to live in and maintain if right. they're not efficient right. houses. And then they can sell it at a huge profit. And, uh, and that's what they do. They build it and then they sell it. And then we're stuck. How many Costco employees can be accommodated by 30 affordable houses? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and at the downs, that's where they work, live and play. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Do you factor in uh, uh, <clears throat> whether the land is already developed versus undeveloped land? Is that part of this uh, exemption process? You know, so like on Route 1, they're building houses on the, the intersection of Route 1 and, and uh, Gorham Road and, and Black Point Road. That you know, it was already developed. There were no trees there. There wasn't a mm -hmm. there wasn't a forest. There wasn't it was it was developed land, and we're building more houses on. It. To me, that's that's a, a better reason to build there than it would be. You know, I, I, there are still some green spaces along Route One that I would prefer not be developed. Um, how's the does the exception process look at the, the type of land that's proposed for development? Not currently, but it could definitely be part of that. The use is within the ordinance for yeah. that zone. Yeah. It's, no. it's up to grass. Well, well, I don't think there's been a lot have come through for exemptions. I think okay. it's been the downs came through for an exemption for like, the past year. And I think there's one other. Um, the one on Muzzy Road, yeah, they didn't come in for an exemption. No, they just understand that it's going to be a space. They're going to use the one bedroom because they have 60 of those. Yeah. So they'll use up some so of those. So they're playing within that. So, yeah. okay, now we've checked that off for the rest of the year. Yeah. Sort of thing for, exactly. for the GMO. So, yeah, we're going to have, you know, for till 2024, if they use up 30 of those or 60 of those, rather, we're only going to have 41 bedroom unit exemptions again. So it changes, you know, once you start putting these. Well, it's right. not every year. Add in. A hundred one bedroom units mm -hmm. every year, mm -hmm. even just for well, it's not years. every year, yeah. Wait, yeah, but even just for a few mm -hmm. more years, um, you know, it's cumulative, so yeah, <laughs> for sure. it's not like it's a one and done, it's right? Like, they, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it definitely is adding to, and I think that's the you know, how many people can Scarborough sustain every year, 
you know, is if you just really lowball two per unit, can we do 600 people? Well, and what that does that mean? <laughs> on if they're required to, in the development process, supply enough money to add those to services. Mm -hmm. Um, Offset mean, some of that will come to taxes, right. but that supplies the ongoing services, playing, paying the police mm -hmm. officer, paying the teacher, not the construction of the school or the 10 extra vehicles or whatever those uh, Those are not like that's where the taxes then go up for everyone because. Uh, oh, and April's talking about enterprise business cards. Like their one, they have, I think, 300 or so units that they want to build multifamily. No. Oh. Um, and so they're still out there mm. um, yes. trying to figure out how to make this work. Mm. Um, so, like, if they came in and that's on a random year, yeah, to build some stuff because right. they're having all those facilities right. that people will be working at, mm -hmm. and it would be awesome if there was some housing near the facilities that everybody's going to be working at. But the but, DMO, the way it's written now, limits them. Well, but then you've like got to go down Route One to get in there, and now you've got traffic. Sounds like that in place of three hundred single-family houses on half acre lot, mm -hmm. in terms of a sustainability question um oh and the dmo does a good job of not allowing that right so like there's some you know there's some positive pros and cons yeah. there i think it's a really uh, understanding trying to put some maps together so we can when we go through this we can really see where where can this use go what do we have left where can this use go what do we actually have left is the discussion as big as we think you know if there's only 500 acres of XYZ zoning, what does that really mean? Um, trying to get to that so we can have a really... Uh, yeah, if you had a crystal ball, what would the yeah, road like, look like the in... case scenario in with what years, we've what done look now like. look like? Um, yeah, that's kind of, yeah, yeah, that's kind of an interesting drill to go through. Yeah, so that's what we're working for. Good, thanks, man. Yeah. Thank you for all this. And I think can you can you summarize that? If we don't have to have a response till the twenty third, oh, yes. maybe you could send send it out to. And if you have other thoughts, mm -hmm. just put it in the document, and and yeah, then I'll you guys with, vet it. I'll work with Jamie too to get some of your other. Things. Yeah, I'd like to do a little more thinking after other things written sure. down. Okay, that point covered. That yes. point's covered. Definitely, definitely. Uh, one more one more look at it before we submit it would be nice. Yes, definitely. Definitely want you to see what I wrote down. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a horrible note taker, so, but I love the video. Well, of course, you can't remember to record and this portion of the video. Good, right? good, yeah. good call. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. This is a fun exercise. I'm glad to get. Nice to see getting committee input, and that you know that's a credit to the council. Yeah, and yeah, and that's that. been a piece of the frustration. It has is been. that they proceed with doing things without. Tapping the committee. Sure. Have. They're pretty good about tasking staff, but they don't task committees well, you, and don't listen to committees as much as there's some really good expertise on all these committees. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing that I'm not used to, which I'm like, oh, this is great. There's like people that know things, right? And that's really useful for staff, I think, moving forward. So yeah, I was excited to see that. And while we didn't get to the ordinance update discussion, I feel like the discussion that we had here is going to help kind of inform that discussion also and figuring out how we can fit in more energy efficiency requirements into our ordinances. Because like you said, if our ordinances are where they need to be, then the GMO is going to have make less of a, a difference in the long run. We should be in a place where- That's right. Yeah, I would have, a, I'd rather have a ordinance to help the built environment than do have a GMO to, to force that. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, because you may not get what, because the, what does come in, um, to the other gentleman's point, may not have been what you wanted anyway, but they made it in with the, the number, right? And yeah. So, yeah, because they got there first. Yes. Yeah. No, this is great. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, we are way over. So yeah. thank you. Yeah, but thanks for the patience. Uh, when are we meeting again? Oh. That is a good point. So we are taking January off or December. December off. Oh my gosh, I'm so messed up on my months. Um, I am going to be at a conference for our January meeting. So I was wondering if we can move it the week prior. To the, so we would normally be the 25th. I'm proposing the 18th. Since we're missing December, we can meet a little bit earlier in January if everyone. It does that make sense. Uh, let me just, not that. 
as the person voting. So I already have it. Uh, so you're saying the 14th? I'm saying the 18th. 18th. Oh, look at January. January, so yeah. <laughs> So we won't 18th. meet in December, and I'm proposing January 18th. Oh, no, no, that works for me. All right. Yeah. All right, so I will make that um, calendar adjustment for everyone. Um, so it'll be there. You're always good at that. You always okay. do that. All right. That's what we got. All right. Thanks, folks. Thank you all. Have a happy holidays. Yes. And Eric, do you do the package?